Peter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water." Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, 
but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Peter begins 1 Peter chapter 3 with likewise wives. Likewise what? Peter has been writing to these exiles to live their lives in such a way so that the world will see their good deeds and glorify God for what they are doing. 1 Peter 2 verse 12. Peter told them to yield to every human authority. Verse 13. Honor everyone. Verse 17. And to yield to our masters who are over us. Verse 18. The theme has been to live our lives with such conduct so as to win people over to God, chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, Peter is commanding wives to yield also. And this is what verse 1 says. Wives are to be subject to their own husbands. Wives are to yield to their husbands. Lifestyle evangelism carries itself even into the home. Our holy conduct is not simply when we are outside of our homes, but remains inside the homes as well. Verse 1 pictures the scenario where a wife who has a husband who is not obedient to God's word, Peter's instruction is to win the husband over by your conduct. He says, wives, your godly lives, will speak to them without any words. You are going to be a wife unlike any wife found in the world. You are not going to nag or pest. You are simply going to continue your godly conduct regardless of how he acts. Wives, you cannot excuse yourself from acting in righteousness and yielding just because he is not acting the way he ought to act. Just because he does not act like a Christian does, does not mean you cannot act like a Christian. In fact, it is all the more important that you act in a godly way in your marriage relationship. Now, Peter goes on to say that husbands will be won over when they see your respectful and pure conduct. I believe it is a terrible decision for a wife to waver in her faith when a husband is weak or unbelieving. If he does not want to obey the Lord, wives, you still need to obey the Lord. If he doesn't want to go to church, you need to go to church. If he does not want to serve, you still need to serve. You can be respectful and yielding while maintaining pure conduct, but your husband will not be won over if they do not see God as a priority in your life, and if they do not see your respectful and pure conduct and how they are treated. Wives are to do good for the Lord and do good for the husbands, even if he is not a believer. Verse 3, not only will wives have a different behavior as Christian wives, but they will also have a different focus. Peter says not to focus on the externals only. Wives, your beauty should not only be what you look like, but also who you are spiritually. Your beauty comes from the heart, revealing the quiet and gentle spirit. Your heart is valuable to God, and having the character of quietness and gentleness is very precious to God. Now, the word translated into gentleness from the Greek is commonly described as strength under control. It's a trait used of Jesus, and it is, a command, and it is commanded of all Christians. One commentator describes gentleness as the person who is so much in control of himself that he is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. Now, I will say that this text has been taken to an extreme. Some think this is saying that wives are not to focus on their outward beauty at all. Well, that can't be what the text says. Otherwise, Peter is telling wives not to wear clothing. Notice that the sentence has a not but construction here. This means that there is an implied only in the teaching. Wives, your adorning should not only be the external hair, jewelry, clothing, but also, but also the adorning of the internal. Wives, it is not a sin to look nice and dress well. Spouses don't try to attract each other by looking as terrible as we possibly can. We try to look good for each other. 
but understand that your greatest beauty comes from your godliness. The world emphasizes so much on the external that it's easy for wives to forget what is most important. Husbands, you can help by pointing out that we think that our spouses are beautiful, especially because of who they are. Wives look nice, but don't forget what is very precious in God's sight. Verse 5, holy women in the past who placed their hope in God also adorned themselves inside and out. They clothe themselves with the yielding attitude that Peter has been commanding all Christians to have. Sarah is then used as an example of this godly yielding attitude. Sarah is to be the model for the life of the Christian wife. Now, this text is often misunderstood as well. Peter is not commanding wives to call their husbands Lord or Master. I think I need to say that again. Peter is not commanding wives to call their husbands Lord or Master. Peter is asking us instead to learn from the example of Sarah calling Abraham Lord. Peter is describing the culture of a lost era where wives showed respect to their husbands by calling them Lord or Master. Now, Lord or Master was not an unusual expression like it is today. For example, it kind of bothers some of us that Jesus in John 2 verse 4 addresses his mother as woman. We think maybe Jesus was being rude or impolite, but Jesus was not because we fail to understand the language of the culture. Jesus is following the custom of the day. And so it was also the custom of the day for wives to call their husbands Lord. In fact, the Jews of the first century saw Sarah's language in Genesis 18 verse 12 as evidence of the proper respectful attitude toward the husband. This is clearly not our custom today. The point that we learn is that Sarah spoke with respect to Abraham. Sarah showed a yielding spirit in her conversation with Abraham. By doing good, you are children of Sarah. Even if your husband is not a believer, you are still heirs of the promise if you remain godly and faithful. Verse 6 reminds us that this yielding places the wife in a vulnerable position. She is trusting her husband to act in her best interest. But Peter says that she should not fear anything. She is yielding for the sake of Christ. Don't fear. Do what is right. Live godly. Have a quiet and gentle spirit. Yield, not out of fear or social position, but out of obedience to Christ. Now, husbands are not off the hook. Notice verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, this is also a misunderstood and tortured text. So let's clear away all the false teaching here and get to the heart of the matter. First, notice the word likewise. Likewise what? Well, 1 Peter 2, verse 13, 1 Peter 2, verse 18, and 1 Peter 3 and verse 1. Notice that the theme here is yielding. Husbands are to likewise yield. How? Yield by living with your wives in an understanding way. Husbands, this is certainly a call for living with your wives and treating your wives in an understanding, considerate way. Husbands, you cannot be harsh with your wives. You cannot order her around. You cannot tell her what to do. You are not to act like you are the boss. No one told you that you are the boss. God told wives to yield to the husband's headship, but God did not tell you husbands to act like a head. You are to yield by living with your wives in an understanding way. Now, the middle part of the verse also teaches husbands how to yield with their wives. Yield by showing honor to her as a weaker vessel. Now, carefully read those words a few times. Does the text say, that she is a weaker vessel? No, no. Um, it says, as the weaker vessel. We know that a woman is not weaker spiritually. 
Some have typically argued that she is weaker physically. But what does her physical weakness have to do with the point that Peter is making? What does that have to do with living with her in an understanding way? It's better to understand the text the way the ESV renders this verse. Husbands are to show the wife honor as a weaker vessel. That she is to be treated as a prized, valuable possession. She is not to be treated as a common vessel, but as a vessel that is delicate and fragile. Now, the text does not say she is fragile. It says you will treat her that way. Maybe you have a family heirloom or something that's been passed down from generation to generation. Do you just stick it in a corner somewhere in the back of a closet and just forget about it? No, usually you put it up somewhere high, uh, maybe even behind a curio cabinet, something to display it. And it may not be fragile. It could be great grandma's iron skillet, but we treat it with honor and we treat it as delicate and fragile because it's valuable to us. It's important to us. So show her honor like a precious, delicate vessel. Treat her with respect. She is not inferior. In fact, Peter goes on to make that very point. She is a fellow heir of the grace of life. Treat her as equal in the pursuit of serving God. She is an heir with you, not a slave under you. Let's not miss the last part of the teaching so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, when you are not treating your wives with honor, when you're not living with her in compassion and in an understanding way, and when you do not show her honor as a fellow heir with you, your prayers are blocked, he says. Peter says God is not listening to you. Let me say it in another way. You do not have a relationship with God. Don't think that you can treat your wife as a slave and still be in a relationship with God. Don't think that you can boss her around, command her, mistreat her, or make demands of her and think that you are not separated from God. Don't think that you can be harsh with your wife and not be in sin. Show her honor and kindness. Verse 8 begins with that word, finally. Finally clues us in that we are still learning from the Apostle Peter about lifestyle evangelism and our need to yield to one another and honor one another. Peter gives us five traits for all disciples of Jesus. So he says we are to have unity of mind. We are called to have our minds governed by the mind of Christ. The unity of our hearts and minds is very important, but this unity does not come from a standard imposed from without, like a doctrinal statement. The scriptures do not tell us to have a this is what we believe sheet, and make all of us sign it and then claim that we have unity. Unity of mind will come when we have two things working together. Number one, a common focus on Jesus. We must all desire to serve Jesus and follow Jesus above all else. We will not have unity if we have another life focus or purpose for coming. Number two, the study and discussion of the scriptures together. We will come to unity of the faith when we study together and discuss the scriptures together. And then he says we need to have sympathy. We need to have a fellow feeling with one another. This means we are emotionally connected and have great care for one another. We need to be moved by those that we know and have a fellow feeling for what our brother or sister is going through. And then brotherly love, another statement that shows that we are to be connected We've talked a great deal about brotherly love. In fact, in chapter 1, in verse 22, we must develop that kinship with one another. Then, tender heart. It's a wonderful picture of a heart that is not callous toward each other. A humble mind. A willingness to take a lower place. Even in the first century, humility was considered a sign of weakness and shame. That belief is still true today. But to God, humility is a sign of great strength, that we have the ability to take a second place and let others be first. Just like Jesus acted, so we must also act in humility. The family of Christians is to be a place of comfort, not suffering. We have suffering in the world. We need to come together to find the words and actions that we need to be godly and to be encouraged. 
And that is true for all Christians. Verse 9, he tells us to not repay evil for evil. How do we treat those who are not fellow Christians? Do we get to treat them differently, especially if they are causing us to suffer? Now, the first instruction here, not paying evil for someone who does evil towards us, tells us that when someone insults us, we don't respond with insults in return. Remember again in our study in chapter 2, the example of Jesus in verse 23, that we are told that we do not respond in kind because we have been born again to a living hope. Our love is not constrained to the people within the local church. Our love is not constrained to those who treat us well or to people that we like. So what are we supposed to do with people who are mocking us, insulting us, injuring us? Peter commands us to bless them. Don't curse them. Rather, we are to speak well of them publicly. And we may think we can't do this, but Peter intervenes against such a thought by pointing out that we are called to do this. We are called to this response of blessing those who curse you. We are called to do this because that's exactly what Jesus did. 1 Peter 2 verse 23. We are called to be different. We are called to act different. We are called to handle insults and reviling differently than the way others deal with it. We are to return good for the evil brought against us. We have been called to bless people. And we need to live life thinking about how we can bless people. How can I speak well of people? Typically, our mind turns to how we can curse people and slander people. True followers of Jesus change their thinking toward how to speak well of people. But if we want to have the blessing of God, then we must speak well and do good to those who are even our enemies. Now, to prove this teaching, the Apostle Peter quotes Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. This is the reason we bless and don't revile in return. Because if you want to have a good, joyful life, you will do this. Keep your tongues from evil. Keep your lips from speaking lies. Turn away from evil. Do good. Seek peace. Pursue peace. If you want God to be with you in this life, then you will not respond to evil with evil. You will not retaliate when made to suffer. You see how Peter is presenting this? The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and he listens to their prayers. If we are retaliating, reviling, or acting like the world treats us, then we are not the righteous. His eyes are not on us, and God is not listening to our prayers. Instead, God is against us because we are doing evil to those who do evil. Peter now comes full circle to a similar exhortation from chapter 2 and verse 12. We are told to do good and exercise lifestyle evangelism. I keep using that phrase today. I keep using that phrase today. Maybe you're wondering what I mean by lifestyle evangelism. That means not just that we teach people the truth when we sit down across from them from the table, but also we are teaching them the truth by the way that we live our lives. That we are, in fact, preaching to them by the way that we live. That we don't just talk our talk, we also walk our walk. Peter amplifies that teaching, pushing us further to the knowledge that we are to do good and exercise lifestyle evangelism even within the context of suffering. The first question that Peter poses in verse 13 is to point out that by doing good and being righteous, we will avoid much of the suffering in the world. Often we make bad decisions and cause our own problems and our own suffering. Peter reminds us of that fact. The scriptures teach us that often in other places. But we know that this is not an absolute rule, and even Peter here acknowledges this. We can suffer for the sake of righteousness. So we are instructed to live good lives, reflecting God's glory so that people will glorify God and so that we will have good, joyful lives. But even if we do suffer for doing good, Peter reminds us that we are not to be troubled by that. Don't let suffering for the sake of Christ cause us to stop. We must continue to honor Jesus as holy and teach others about the hope that we have despite our suffering. Now, Peter has taught us something very deep and important. Suffering is not the time to avoid the world, but to engage the world. We may not be able to fix our suffering. Most of the time, we cannot fix or change our suffering at all. 
but we can use our suffering for the glory of God. We can make our suffering purposeful. Peter tells us that this is an opportunity to defend the hope that we have. When we are suffering, yet still do good and still have faith, we will be presented with the opportunities to defend the hope that we have. Use your suffering to help people meet Jesus. Our lifestyle evangelism, there's that phrase again, is that people will see how this whole Jesus thing works in our lives in the face of suffering. Being a Christian during good times does not teach the world much of anything. But if we continue our righteousness and service to Jesus in the face of devastating suffering, we then have opened doors for the world to consider this Jesus. When we have joy, when we ought to be sad, the world is going to look at us and wonder why we have not just utterly collapsed. Suffering is the opportunity for us to honor Jesus as holy in our hearts. When we use our suffering for selfishness, too often that is the choice we make. We have been conditioned to think that suffering allows us to have a me too or focus on myself attitude and neglect our obligations to others. Sometimes those who have suffered are the most selfish people. Sometimes it causes us to act like the world needs to revolve around us and everyone needs to think about me. We need to make our suffering purposeful. You are suffering. You can't change that. I can't change that for you. Your suffering is, is what it is. But will you honor Christ as holy during your suffering? Will you give a defense for your hope and show your faith during your suffering? This is true lifestyle evangelism to the world. Now, verse 18 to the end of the chapter is considered by many to be the most difficult passage to interpret. There are a number of different interpretations that have been given about these verses. And as we study the text, I think it's important that we make sure we don't come out of the context. These verses have been lifted from their context, which brings about many of the different interpretations that we encounter. So let's look at the verses surrounding this controversial text and see if it gives us some clarity about what Peter is doing. And remember that Peter has been talking about how we handle suffering. And we know that Peter is still on this topic in verse 18 because the verse begins with the word for. So we're still talking about that. The topic is continuing here about suffering. The point is not simply that Jesus died on our behalf, that he did it for us. The purpose of Jesus' suffering for us is to bring us to God. Sin separates us from God. We cannot spend eternity with God with our wickedness attached to us. We are separated and Jesus died to deal with our sins so that we could be brought to God through his suffering. The connection is that Jesus suffered for doing good, and we also suffer for doing good. Now, I think before we can have a pity party for ourselves, we must remember that Jesus did this for us. Because we think that we are going through so much, nobody's ever gone through what I've gone through. I've suffered more than you could possibly imagine. You just don't know what I'm going through. I may not. You're right. But Jesus does. Let's never forget what Jesus has done for us. And I think this is the purpose of Peter's instruction here. We will suffer for doing the will of God. But never forget that the one we follow also suffered for doing the will of God. And that suffering was for us. In fact, he was put to death for us. He was put to death and raised from the dead so that we would be reconciled to God. Now, this is where interpretations veer all over the place. Some teach that between the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, he went to the realm of the dead and he preached to Noah's contemporaries. Jesus either preached the gospel to save their souls or proclaimed the good news that he had been victorious. But there are just volumes of problems with that viewpoint. First, the scriptures do not teach anywhere that salvation can be obtained after death. I mean, remember Luke chapter 16 in the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Can't change one's eternal destination after death. Secondly, 
why would Jesus preach only to Noah's contemporaries? Are there not billions more that would need to hear the gospel? Thirdly, if Jesus only made proclamation about his victory, why was this victory proclamation only made to Noah's contemporaries who are lost? So Jesus did not, after his death, but before his resurrection, preach to the dead who lived the time of Noah but drowned. Another view is that Jesus preached to fallen angels. The spirit of prison are understood in this viewpoint to be disobedient angels. But again, there's a problem here because the scriptures never teach anything to this effect. Further, the Hebrew writer tells us, remember in our study in Hebrews 2 and verse 16, that salvation is not extended to angels but only to humans. Jude verse 6 tells us that disobedient angels are in everlasting chains awaiting judgment. There is no opportunity for salvation for disobedient angels. Another interpretation is that Jesus proclaimed victory to those who had died. The problem with that is, why? And such a concept takes Jesus and places him in the selfish act of saying, I've won, I did it, woohoo, look at me and telling that to a whole bunch of people who clearly have lost. Again, we have the problem of why this declaration would only be made to those who were Noah's contemporaries. But let's go back to the original theme. What do these teachings have to do with suffering? How does this information help the reader who is suffering for doing good? Even if these interpretations have merit, the problem is that these interpretations only work outside of the context, but do not fit the flow of Peter's instructions on how to deal with suffering for doing good. So what is Peter teaching? Let's not miss the focus of the text. We have become so consumed with the meaning of the spirits in prison and Jesus' proclamation that we have missed how suffering fits into Peter's point. Do you think Noah had a life of suffering? The scriptures declare him to be a preacher of righteousness. He lived in a day when the thoughts of humanity were continually wicked. Only eight people were saved from God's judgment. Noah went around preaching to people to repent of their sins and warned them that it was going to rain so much that the earth would be flooded. It had never rained on earth before. How much ridicule did Noah endure? How much mockery came his way year after year as he built an enormous boat to keep animals and people? Day after day, month after month, year after year, for 120 years, Noah and his family are building a large boat to save the world from a flood. Christ was preached through Noah to those who chose to be disobedient. I submit to you that this is the simplest way to understand this text. Jesus went and preached to those disobedient in the days of Noah through Noah himself, and only eight believed. Peter used this language earlier in 1 Peter 1 and verses 10 through 12, where Christ spoke through the prophets about suffering and the subsequent glories. So notice the picture. Jesus suffered for our sins unjustly because he was innocent. Though killed in the flesh, he was delivered by God when he was raised in the spirit. Noah suffered as a preacher of righteousness. And though he suffered, he was delivered from the destruction of the earth by the flood through the ark. Peter's focus is on the fact that Noah preached, but they disobeyed and only a few were delivered but they were delivered despite the suffering that they endured. And then he says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Baptism corresponds to this deliverance. Baptism is not just external washing. This is a very important statement. Baptism is not a mindless act. 
baptism has no value as an action without the heart. This is not a ritual. This is not a ceremonial act. I think it's a mistake for churches to count success or growth as in how many folks were baptized. Sometimes we do overemphasize the action of baptism. Our effort is not to get people wet. Our purpose is not only baptism. Too often, baptism is seen as the end result. We get there and we're like, ooh, chalk one up. But just as much faith alone does not save, neither does baptism alone save. God has asked us to be changed people living in the holiness of God, exercising the fruit of the Spirit. If baptism was all that there was for us to do, then the scriptures did not need to be so lengthy. So let's be clear that baptism is not ritualistic. Just because you are immersed in water does not mean that you are saved. There's nothing special in the water, nothing special with the preacher, the words, or the church. So what is important? What is the point of baptism? What are we doing when we are baptized? And how does baptism save us if it is not through some ritualistic sacrament? Carefully examine Peter's words. Baptism is the appeal to God for a clean conscience. In baptism, we are appealing to God, pleading with God, and begging God to cleanse us and erase our sins. We are asking him to cleanse our consciences and give us new life in him. This is our heart appealing to God as we are submitting ourselves to his will. We are asking for deliverance. We are asking for salvation. Baptism is how we make that appeal to God's grace for forgiveness. Baptism is how we call on the name of the Lord. Baptism alone does not save. Ritualistic, ceremonial baptism is not in view. Once I am convicted of my sin, and I realize that I need salvation for my sins, then I need to appeal to God for mercy, pleading for forgiveness. Baptism is how that appeal to God's grace is made. All this is based on the resurrection of Jesus. We have deliverance because Jesus died and was raised from the dead. This salvation is, is not based on our righteousness or our deeds, but because of Jesus' righteousness and Jesus' deeds. Baptism is how we ask God for his grace. Now notice how all this fits together. These Christians are suffering for doing good. Peter has told them to continue to do good even in the face of adversity. They can do this because Jesus suffered for our sins and he suffered unjustly. Jesus put his trust in God and was delivered from death and raised to life. Noah suffered as a preacher of righteousness by those who were disobedient in his day. Noah was delivered from the flood. We are to be preachers of righteousness to the world who is lost. We will suffer for preaching righteousness and doing good, and we may only save a few. But in continuing to do good, we will also experience deliverance and salvation from judgment because we have made our appeal to God for a clean conscience through baptism. We may be in the minority as Noah was, but that does not mean that our salvation is not secure. Though rejected by the world, as Jesus and Noah were, we are alive to God and know that we have not been rejected by him. Now, Peter is not done talking about suffering. And so, next time, 1 Peter chapter 4. I look forward to that study. Thank you so much. Have a great and wonderful day. Oh,